Today we are going to learn managerial remuneration as per section 197 of Companies Act 2013. For the purpose of managerial remuneration, we need to know who are the people covered under managerial remuneration bracket, meaning who exactly are managerial person. Managerial person can be categorized into two broad classifications. Number one is a director, number two is a non-director. People who are not the directors of the company can also manage the company. Yes. Directors can be broadly classified into three categories. Number one is a whole time director. Number two is a part time director. And the last one, the one in the middle is a managing director. Whole time director is a director who comes to the company like an employee every damn day. So he is not just a director of the company in the capacity of the director. He is also the goddamn employee of the company. The part time director is the director of the company who is interested in the company only and only for the sake of sitting fees. He comes to the company exclusively for board meetings and then says tata and goes back home. Whereas the managing director is one person who is head of all the directors. So is one among the whole time or part time directors who goes down to become the person with supreme authority in the company. The man with the crown who is going to take ultimate decision making of the company. So, a managing director is a whole time director who has a power over all the other whole time directors. Whereas, if the company is of the opinion that no whole time director is competent enough to become the supreme authority of the company, then they can appoint a person who is not a director as a person with supreme authority in the company that is manager. So, manager or managing director is a person with supreme authority. Meaning, a company can either have a managing director or they can have a manager. They cannot have managing director as well as a manager together. So, a company can have more than one whole time director, more than one part time director and a managing director. Or, a company can have more than one whole time director, more than one part time director and a manager. But, in any given scenario, there cannot be a managing director and a manager together in the composition of managerial personnel. Now, if company have any combination of these managerial person, how is the remuneration going to be? Because the efforts of the manager and the profits of the company are directly related. The company might decide to give managerial remuneration as a percentage of profit. Meaning, more profits in the company, more remuneration to managers. Less profits in the company, less remuneration to managers. So, the maximum remuneration limits are given as a percentage of profit. If the company doesn't have a whole time director, managing director or a manager, meaning none of the directors who are whole time directors or managing director or manager comes and sits in the company taking care of the affairs, then the responsibilities of the part time director will be more. As their responsibilities are more, they get 3% of the net profit as their remuneration. Whereas if there is a whole time director, managing director or a manager, then the responsibilities of the part time director is less. So they get lesser remuneration of 1%. So if there is a whole time director, managing director or manager, remuneration is 3%. If there is no whole time director, managing director or manager, remuneration is 1%. This is with respect to part time director. However, with respect to whole time director, managing director and manager, if there are only just one in number, they would get 5%. If there are more than one in number, they will get 10%. What if there are three? More than one, 10%. And these limits of 3%, 1%, 5% and 10%, is given of net profit and in any given scenario more maximum remuneration limit possible is 11 percent because here if three is counted we cannot count this because there is no managing director manager or holding director so if we consider one then we can count here so considering one and the maximum of 10 here it will be 11 percent of the profits as managerial remuneration and this is not per person this is for all managerial persons put together for the entire year. Net profit for the purpose of managerial remuneration is given like this. There are few debit items which are allowed to be included in net profit. There are few debit items which are not allowed to be included in net profit. There are few credit items which are allowed and few credit items are not. What are the debit items allowed? Debit and credit items are allowed if they are normal course of the operation, meaning if they are operating actual or revenue in nature. What is not allowed is when it is not in tenable with law or it is not actual or it is a capital expenditure. Now, talking about operating expenditure, like any normal working expenditure, which is like administrative expenditure, selling and distribution expenditure, any employee benefit expenditure is allowed. 
whereas any expenditure which is actually incurred is again a loan. Repairs expenditure, irrespective of the time, irrespective of the amount, if it is not capital and it is actual, it is allowed as an item. Whereas if we create provision for the sake of the repair, it is not allowed because it is not actual and it is provision. Talking about depreciation, depreciation is allowed if it is in line with company's act. If you have followed your own method of depreciation based on your own rates, the depreciation as per books is not allowed. And talking about not in law, one is depreciation, other one is any contributions made. If it is voluntarily you have contributed some donation or compensation, it is not allowed. Whereas if it is a legal compensation contributed, definitely allowed as an expense. Any donation or charity made, if it is in line with the provisions according to the act, it is allowed as an expense. If not, definitely no. Now talking about incomes. Incomes are usually allowed. Any trading income, any sales are definitely allowed. Whereas what is not allowed is capital incomes like premium on issue of shares or profit on or feature of shares when the call scenarios exist. So these items are not allowed. What is something very tricky, what needs to be seen very little importantly is profit arising on sale of assets. We usually consider profit arising on sale of assets as capital profit whereas profit for the purpose of managerial remuneration doesn't see like it. Whenever the selling consideration what you receive for the sale of assets exceeds the original cost, it is considered as capital profit whereas whenever the sale consideration received is anything lesser than the original cost. Meaning that book value and selling price difference is treated as revenue, selling price and then original cost difference is always treated as capital profit. Capital profits are not allowed to be included, revenue profits are allowed to be included. Other than all these items that we discussed, if in case you received any subsidy from the government for the purpose of issue of managerial reputation, such profit has to be included in net profit for the purpose of computation of percentage of net profit, percentage of profit as managerial remuneration. Remuneration can be given as a percentage of profit when the company makes profit. What if the company doesn't make huge profits or the company makes losses? So company act tells in the event of inadequate profits, you can give remuneration on the basis of effective capital. Meaning if the company has huge capital, managers have a lot of money to manage so they would have to get more remuneration. If the capital of the company is less, they have very less money to manage, they would get very less remuneration. So based on the limits given by the act, if the effective capital is up to 5 crores or in fact negative also, up to plus 5, the maximum remuneration is 60 lakhs. If the effective capital is between 5 and 100 crores, the remuneration is 84 lakhs. If it is between 100 and 250 crores, it is 120 and if it is more than 250 crores, up to 250, you will get 120 plus any amount exceeding 250 crores, you would get 0.01% of the effective capital exceeding 250 crores. Now, when we use this word so many times, we will be curious enough to know what exactly we mean by effective capital. The definition of effective capital given by company stack includes paid up capital, whether equity or preference. It will include all the resource and surplus including security premium, but it will not include revaluation reserve which is not actually realized in cash and preliminary expenses and paid like a debit balance which might arise have to be deducted from the resource and surplus as per schedule 3 rule. If you have any preliminary expenses, it has to be deducted from the total of resource and surplus in the very first year. If you have any paid like on debit balance, it has to be treated as a negative item in computation of effective capital. And you can use long term borrowings and deposits, you can add them up as a part of your effective capital if they are borrowed for a period exceeding one year. Meaning if you need not repay them within the next one year, it is part of your effective capital, if not no. Then there is a very important adjustment that is given with respect to investment companies and non-investment companies. If the company is an investment company, the investments held by the company are to be managed by the managers. So that need not be directed from the effective capital. Whereas if the company is a non-investment company, whatever the investments which are non-current, which are appearing on the asset side of the balance sheet have to be deducted from this sum to find the effective capital. I will repeat, if in case the company is a non-investment company, non-current investments on the asset side of the balance sheet have to be deducted to find the effective capital. If it is an investment company, you need not do any computations. What we discuss right now are the limits and this limits of 60, 84, 120 and 120 plus whatever is there. This is not per person, this is for all the managerial persons put together and per annum. However, these limits can be doubled if you comply with the conditions given by Schedule 5 of Company Act, along with a special resolution and government permission from the NCA. These limits can be doubled. 
you can opt to pay beyond these limits if you comply with schedule 5 of that pass a special resolution in the general meeting and also take the government's assent this is managerial remuneration